the book's called How the World Thinks, which is, of course, a, a hugely ambitious title, but you have to have a title which grabs people these days. Uh, but it's, it's, it's got a serious intent, of course. The idea of the book... Well, the idea started because I just became curious about non-Western philosophy. And it might be, it's embarrassing almost to admit that, because you know, I've got a PhD in philosophy, right? and I got it many years ago. So you might think you have a PhD in philosophy, therefore your curiosity one runs wide. It's just not the case. In the English-speaking world, philosophy is taught as though it's a discipline which began in ancient Greece and ran through Europe, and there's virtually nothing taught outside the Western tradition. On the understanding that there are other things we call, like Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, and so forth, and it's not that these things aren't interesting, but whatever they are, they're not really philosophy as we know it, are they? They're kind of different. Now, that sounds like a, a terrible prejudice, and in many ways it is a terrible prejudice, but it's kind of understandable because... The point is, in different parts of the world, people are always examining the same big questions. So I divide the book up into four parts based on kind of what these are. Questions like, how do we know? What are the, what are the legitimate sources of knowledge? What's the fundamental nature of the world and the universe? What kind of things are we? What makes us selves individuals? And then how ought we to live as individuals and societies? So of course, Every culture looks at all of those questions. Uh, they do so in different ways. And if you're sort of schooled in one tradition, the ways in which people think about them in other traditions can seem very strange, hard to get a grip on. And so I think for that reason, it sometimes just looks like whatever they're doing, they're doing something else. But as time went by, I became increasingly convinced that, you know, there was a family resemblance, this is a term Wittgenstein used at least, between these different kinds of philosophy, and to have no interest at all in them was rather parochial. I also had the idea, just an hypothesis, that perhaps looking at different philosophical traditions was also potentially a way of understanding those... Philosophy could be a window into culture. Now, as I talk to people, because to write the book, you have to appreciate that no one is an expert on global philosophy. There are probably you know, a handful of people who have done, spent decades and decades of scholarship who might be able to claim to be sort of absolute experts in global philosophy, but even they would probably admit that they spread themselves so thinly that they're not really experts as such. So you can't write this project as someone who's an expert. So I kind of drew upon not just my philosophical background, but my sort of journalistic background. So I describe myself as like a philosophical journalist. The idea is I would obviously read key texts and everything, but I would talk to the people who really knew. I would talk to the experts and then try and distill things from them. And what I was trying to get at were the, the ways in. I put it in the, in the introduction to the book, I say it's what you need to understand to begin to understand. You can't pretend to have a thorough introduction to all the world's philosophy in one book. You couldn't do it in a dozen books. But what you can do, I think, is try and identify those key ideas which enable you to sort of like just begin to get a sense of what's importantly different in other traditions of thought. That's quite important because for two reasons. The first thing is it does, it does give you an insight into culture. I'm convinced of that. Everyone I spoke to, every expert I spoke to, bar one, said that they definitely believe that if you want to understand China today, classical Chinese philosophy is a huge help. If you want to stand, understand the Islamic world today, Islamic philosophy is a help, and so on. So that's interesting. But importantly, it's very important to remember that it's not as though the way people think in different parts of the world and in different parts of history are entirely and radically different. You know, there isn't a Chinese way of thinking which is completely the opposite and different to a uh, Western way of thinking and so forth. There's a comparative philosopher called Tom Kasulis, who I quote a lot in the book because he's so often so insightful. And he says this very important thing. He says, the way to think about it is that what's foreground in one culture is background in another, and vice versa. 
Now, that's a really important thought, I think, because it means that when you're looking at ideas in other traditions of philosophy, you're not only helping to understand them, you're also then able to understand your own culture a bit better. Because you see the ideas in your own culture which make it distinctive, the things that we take for granted, which actually other people don't take for granted. But you also kind of notice those kind of ideas which are lurking in the background, which maybe we could benefit from taking out of the background and giving a bit more prominence. And I'll, I'll give a couple of examples of this in a minute. So, I mean, for example, you know, the idea that philosophy and culture are intimately related might seem exotic, but just think about the way in which we think about ourselves and we think about politics and so forth in the West, typically. People talk about liberty, they talk about freedom. And these are very important values. And these ideas of liberty and freedom are based around certain ideas of in the individual, the individual as an autonomous, rational agent, and so forth. Now, all of these things have a deep philosophical history. They are ideas and concepts. Now, we're not aware of those. We make assumptions. It's implicit. But behind our thinking about ourselves and society and freedom, there are philosophical ideas lurking. And if you pick away at the philosophical ideas, I think you perhaps get a better understanding of the way things um, are. So I want to just sort of talk about a couple of the uh, main ideas. Before so, I just want to have a bit of a warning. In, in the book, I can be very, very careful <laughs> about not falling into certain traps that doing comparative thinking can lead you into. In a short talk, it's very easy for it to look as I'm falling into those traps. So I just want to flag them up. One thing I've alluded to already, which is that you should never sort of exoticize other ideas, right? You know, oh, the Chinese think this, the Japanese think that, the Indians think, as though this is some totally strange foreign way of thinking, right? Um, it can, if it comes across like that, it shouldn't do. We're talking about things which have a certain salience in the culture and we're, they're not completely absent in ours. The other thing is about essentializing. We're talking about Chinese, Indian, Western. Now, of course, we're making generalizations. Now, generalizations are not problematic as long as you don't confuse them for universal statements. So to say that in Indian philosophy X, Y, Z, what you're saying is that certain things have tended to be dominant in Indian philosophy. You're not saying that all Indians think like this and all Indian philosophers have thought like that. So d do bear that in mind. If I seem to be making sweeping generalizations, remember I'm only ever talking about what has been more dominant and more prevalent. And, and it's important so therefore not to exaggerate difference. But let me just perhaps choose two or three um, ideas which are important and useful ways of thinking about other cultures which I think we can profit from thinking about. The first is this idea of harmony, which is a really important value in Confucian thinking in China, also to a certain extent in Taoism as well, although it's primarily a Confucian ideal. Now, this word harmony, I, before I went to China, I had done some research, and you know, it, it's uncontroversial amongst Chinese scholars, scholars of Chinese philosophy, to say that harmony is the primary, primary ethical and political value in Chinese philosophy. But I really did wonder whether or not this was important for the culture. Well, <laughs> I arrived in Chufu. Chufu is the birthplace of Confucius. And there's a temple there. And like a lot of Chinese cities, it's, you know, there's an old little city there and around it is a much bigger one being built at remarkable pace and remarkable scale. Chufu East is dwarfing the rest of Chufu. And I, I was passing a, a massive housing development, a huge housing development. And I saw the slogan, you know, housing developments have slogans. They had it translated into English. Um, Live in Confucianism, life is harmony. <laughs> Right now, I, and this is interesting because have, have you ever, ever known any um, housing developments in in Europe to sort of use philosophers as part of their marketing pitch? Right, but the second thing was again this word harmony. It was being used in a in an advertising pitch. Clearly, harmony is a concept that resonates with the Chinese, and in fact, it is used a lot. If you read English language uh, Chinese newspapers, you'll find lots of government statements talk about harmony, 
I'll come back to why that might be problematic in a minute, but they do. And in, actually, in everyday conversation, it's something that came up. So, so what, what is harmony? Now, I think that if I was to just say in China, harmony is seen to be an important value, a stereotypical view of China might be, well, yes, it's this authoritarian communist country, and of course people promote harmony because harmony means everybody keeping the peace it means you know not creating a disturbance knowing your place so it's all about compliance and conformity now actually if you look at the classic confucian texts um, it's not about either of those things it's certainly not about sameness the confucian texts use several analogies repeatedly to describe what harmony means and the two main ones the first one is soup <laughs> right what creates a good soup a good soup is not a good soup by having just a couple of ingredients all the same stuff in it that's bland it's uninteresting the harmonious soup contains you know it's a combination of broth herbs spices meats and vegetables it's different things but the different things all put together to create this whole which is greater than the sum of the parts and the other analogy they use a lot is music, un unsurprisingly given the word harmony. And again, harmony in music is not about one instrument or, or the same instruments playing the same notes. It's about a variety of different instruments playing different notes, but in ways which all come together. So a critical notion, a critical aspect of harmony is that it actually requires difference. It's not just that it tolerates difference, it requires it. But it requires the different elements to all be, as it were, cooperating and working together in the name of the whole. It's also not true that harmony means complete, subs unquestioning subservience. Uh, Chinese Confucian thought is hierarchical, there's no doubt about that, and some of the most important hierarchical relations are family ones. But even there, it's very clear that the son has a duty to remonstrate with the father if the father is doing wrong, is seen to be doing wrong. Ultimately, if the, if the father insists, then the son has to ultimately agree to go along with it. But the remonstration is vital. And also, again, the Confucian texts, you see a lot of the... Confucius and Mencius, they advised rulers, they advised leaders, and in doing so, they often challenged them. They didn't just tell them what they wanted to hear. So it's not about just simply slavish obedience, and it's not about everyone being the same. But it is about the idea that perhaps the most important thing, the most important thing, is to maintain harmony within the family, within the town, within the village, within the broader culture. Now, if you think about that, and you, and you see that as having like, you know, over 2,000 years of history in China, I think it does help us to make sense of the way China is today. People often ask the question, you know, why isn't there more of a clamour for democracy in China? And the comfortable answer is, it's just simply not tolerated. The reason it isn't there is because there's a highly oppressive state, and if it weren't for that, everyone would be demanding freedom and democracy because that's what everybody wants, don't they? Now, actually, I think that there's lots of reasons to suggest that a lot of Chinese people would like more liberty and more freedom than they currently get. That's almost certainly true, perhaps. But the point is, harmony is such an important value that it is considered by a lot of people to, to be more important than uh, democracy and more important than individual liberty, individual freedom. And that's not such uh, a strange or unusual thought. I sometimes think, if people think that sounds like an excuse for oppression and totalitarianism, I think, think about some of the Western foreign policy interventions of, well, since the, the war, since the Second World War. A lot of people have been very critical of them. And the criticism has been precisely that in this naive attempt to establish freedom and democracy, in countries that were very fragile and perhaps what often happened was you simply destroyed whatever structures were there and you left people with something even worse. You would call it, in Confucian terms, a disharmonious society. Um, and importantly, of course, in a disharmonious society, you don't have freedom anyway. <laughs> you know, there are lots of countries where 
so-called democratic elections have been established, but in the absence of any kind of peace and harmony in the society, they're largely a kind of sham. So actually, it's not that difficult to get someone who is, in principle, a defender of freedom and democracy to um, agree with a statement that sometimes it's, it's better to maintain a certain harmony in an imperfect freedom than it is to Im try and reach for uh, freedom which um, it, it disestablishes the harmony. So I think you, know, you, can, you can understand more sympathetically what's going on. A second important point to remember, though, is that this is not a defence of the Chinese state as it is at the moment. It's not to say that what you see in China today is a perfect instantiation of harmony. The Chinese Communist Party uses the term harmony a lot, and it has harmonisation as a kind of a, a, you know, a thing which it happens. Now, most people who know Confucius and know China would say that what the Chinese Communist Party refers to as harmony isn't truly Confucian harmony. It is more like obedience and sameness, etc. All that shows you is that people can abuse concepts in the same way that in Western nations, politicians will claim to be promoting freedom and liberty, even as they're actually undermining it. In the same kind of way in China, people could be claiming to be maintaining harmony and promoting harmony, even as, in fact, they're eradicating the kind of difference and dissent which harmony um, depends on. What you can kind of see here is that, again, the philosophical background provides what I'd call the rhetorical space in which public debates are conducted. So in, in Western countries, that the public debate is conducted in the, the space of talk about freedom and liberty. That these are the terms in which we have to discuss things in the same way in China, it's harmony. So this helps you to understand China better, I think. But here's the other thing which I think is always useful when you look at dominant ideas and other philosophical traditions, is that having done that, it then provides a kind of mirror for looking back at your own. You kind of see what makes your own culture different and distinctive. And you can then question, perhaps, whether or not the way we think about things makes certain assumptions, which, which may not be correct, and whether it might be neglecting certain things which are important. And I kind of am somewhat convinced that actually a lot of the problems we're seeing in a lot of democracies, Western democracies, is, uh, can be understood as a kind of a misbalance between values of individual liberty and freedom and harmony, right? That sounds in headline terms like a kind of a, you know, authoritarian, sort of anti-democratic kind of turn, but I don't think it is. I think that what we're seeing is that if you wind back the clock, Western democracies were never democracies in the way that the ancient Greek philosophers thought of democracy. You may well know that Plato and Aristotle were both hugely critical of democracy. They thought it was terrible. And for that reason, a lot of people say, well, Plato and Aristotle, great philosophers, but they got democracy wrong, didn't they? Well, no, actually. <laughs> they got it exactly right, in my view. They kind of said the problem with democracy was, if democracy means, you know, the rule by the people, uh, the people's will, is that, first of all, people aren't necessarily knowledgeable about what's for the best. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, all that, that effectively happens is the majority tyrannise the minority, which isn't uh, any kind of way to, to govern a society. And the third thing is you don't get the important maintenance of rule of law. Rule of law is very important to any kind of peaceful, successful society. You've got to know that the, the laws which stand today are going to stand tomorrow in, in broad terms. Obviously, individual laws can change. But you've got to be confident that the, the significant major laws are not going to be overturned overnight. And the problem with the democracy in its pure form is that you don't get that, because in democracy in its pure form, the people say, we want this, then this happens, even if that means completely chucking out what was before. Now, of course, the point is that's not how democratic societies worked in the West. What happened was that, first of all, it was never about what is the will of the people and now let's do it. Rather, the people were consulted. They elected representatives with a broad agenda, sort of a set of priorities, if you like, and then left it to the representatives to govern for all, right? So these are the very basic principles. 
I think it's really important to recognise that it's not pure democracy, <laughs> because otherwise we get caught up in this idea that we've got to protect democracy and defend democracy, and we realise that actually what, what's most valuable in, in that tradition is that it's not pure democracy at all. In a way, you can see that it was a way of combining a very important element of the people determining the course of the country and the rulers being accountable to the people with principles of harmony, essentially. That the idea is that you don't let the majority tyrannise the minority. That you do govern for all. And so I think, actually, this, this thinking about harmony is, is, is quite a useful way of trying to think about you know, the ways in which d democracy, our ideas of democracy have kind of moved in a certain direction, which has led to a more divisive politics, more divisive societies, because we've slowly drifted into an idea of democracy in that kind of pure form. It's about the will of the people. And there is no such thing as the will of the people because the people are divided, which is precisely why you need to, uh, to rule in a way which creates a certain harmony between them. So that's, that's harmony, a bit, about, a bit about harmony. Let me talk about one other thing which um, I found particularly interesting. In, in Japan, I saw a wonderful sign on the underground. And the sign said, even the greatest masterpiece becomes noise when emanating from earphones. <laughs> right? I'm sure we've all experienced this, right? And it has a nice little diagram of, of, of like someone with headphones on and it's music and the headphones with the music coming out and it being noise. Now, I love that sign, but there's something really interesting about that sign. The sign isn't telling you to do anything, right? Now, all our signs on public transport and public spaces say things like, do not leave litter, take away your dog mess, um, don't use phones, this is a quiet carriage, etc., etc." Here, there's not, you're not being told to do anything. Actually, on the underground, you don't, you're not molested by noise from people's headphones. Um, nor do you have that phenomenon of man-spreading, as it's called, which was the, the famous thing on the New York uh, underground where people would like sit in their chairs and spread out like this, you know, and take up lots of spaces. Why is that? Obviously, there's, there's cultural stuff going on here. Now, I'm very reluctant, again, I, I don't want to oversimplify. There's always lots of dimensions to things, but one important dimension of this is actually related to the very concept of a self and a person and how this differs in different cultures. The Western culture is essentially uh, one in which this, the, the, the individual is the basic unit of society, shall we say. We are all individual human beings. Society is a collection of us put together. So it's a kind of an atomistic view, look at it in those terms. So, this is actually what Margaret Thatcher said. You know, Margaret Thatcher, um, some of you may know her better than others, uh, the famous Prime Minister of, of Britain for a long time, once said in an interview, there's no such thing as society, right? And people often quote that sentence out of context, but what she said was uh, that there's no such thing as society, there were only individual people, individual men, women, families, and so forth, and society was simply, you know, th those things collected, right? And in that sense, that was not a controversial statement. It was actually a kind of a, in a way, an accurate description of the way most people think about things. The individual is the atom of society, and society is the collection of atoms. Now, in probably most other parts of the world, and certainly especially in East Asia, the way in which this is thought about philosophically is the self is understood relationally, right? So in this sense, the fundamental unit is not the individual. The fundamental unit is society, the family, is the groups. And individuals exist only as parts of that whole. Okay. Now, again, if you talk about foreground background, you can see that there's no either or here. Both those ideas are of the atomistic self and what we call the relational self. Both ideas are, ideas are totally comprehensible in whatever culture you go to. So yes, we live in an atomistic, individualistic West, but a lot of people will quote, in, in, in Britain, one of the most famous lines of poetry to be quoted is, no man is an island entire unto itself, right? 
So that's giving you the idea that actually we don't just exist as individuals, we're always part of a society. What's interesting though is that's the most quoted line of poetry because it's something that we kind of have to keep reminding ourselves because actually we easily slide into making the assumption that we're just these individual units. In East Asia, of course, everyone has a sense of each individual as an individual, but the more dominant idea there is that you are an individual in relation to others. Now, being in relation to others creates a more, what I say, pro-social way of thinking. So go back to that sign on the underground. You don't need to say to people, do not do whatever. You just simply remind them of the antisocial consequences and they don't do the antisocial thing. This is quite interesting because from the outside, I think societies like Japan and China can look like they're just conformist societies in which there's a lack of individualism. So you would have seen, if you've been there or you've seen videos, you see everyone getting on to the underground, these, these very orderly masses being crammed in by people actually push them in. And there was a very famous um, busy pedestrian crossing in the middle of the shopping district where everyone's standing there and the lights go green. And it's like this really ordered mass of people. Now, I think from the outside, that looks like what we might call you know, herd behaviour, lack of individualism. And I think it's really important to recognise that's not actually the case. The, I think that in, certainly in Japan, in China, everywhere around the world, people are individuals and they know they're individuals and there is individuality. It's not conformism, it's pro-social pro action. It's a really important difference to get a grip on. Actually, I got a really good insight into this by accident. As I was leaving Japan, I noticed that most of the people on the plane were Japanese, and a lot of them were watching the same in-flight movie. So obviously I was curious, what is, it, what is this movie all the Japanese are into? So I, I called it up and watched it. It's a film called Orange, and it was based on a manga, which is like a you know, comic strip thing. And it was a teen romance, a teen romance, right? But um, it was not like any teen romance that comes out of Hollywood, and not only because the plot hinged upon two suicides, <laughs> which I don't think is a typical Hollywood thing. The point about this teen romance, had a very complicated time travel plot I can't go into, is that the key couple, the key couple were only alone on screen, hardly at all. Now that wasn't just for coyness, because you know, it wasn't about not wanting to show anything too intimate, because they did show them sometimes by themselves, the two of them, talking, not doing anything too, too risque. It was that actually the relation, their relationship was made possible by the friendship group. In a sense, there was no separation. You know, the, the, the couple were not uh, going off into the sunset by themselves. In fact, the very last scene was a sunset scene, but all the friendship group were there. But cr critically, all these people in the friendship group, they had very distinct personalities and looks. You know, even with the subtitles as a foreigner, you could see that. So not a lack of individualism. It's rather just a, a strong feeling of how being who you are is you're a socially embedded individual, and, and that's important. Now, again, so first of all, you can see that's quite an interesting way of trying to understand cultures in China and Japan to try and get beyond the stereotype of just conformism and obedience to try and understand what's going on a bit better. But it's also, I think, extremely useful looking at ourselves because given that, as I say, it's a question of foreground and background, as I'd put it, it's not about absolutes. Is this not a way of thinking about ourselves which make, we might make us question whether or not our balance of seeing the self as an atomistic individual and as a, something in relation to others isn't quite right. It's gone too far in the individualistic direction. Loads of people say, I mean, I've never heard anyone yet say the problem with our society is we're not individualistic enough. <laughs> yeah. Most people say individualism, it's gone too far. You know, it's all, we've all become selfish atomization is this word that people use. So people kind of recognize that it's a problem, but I'm not sure they completely understand what the solution is because we value our individuality, that's for sure, and we certainly don't want a kind of slavish conformism. But actually, I think if you think about this idea of ourselves as relational creatures, it enables us to understand how there's no threat to individuality and there's no demand of conformism by trying to bring more into the foreground the, the aspect of ourselves which acknowledges more fully 
our, our social embeddedness, our relationship to others. So we've got a kind of like way of thinking about ourselves which might be able to, as it were, drag us back from the worst excesses of individualism without having to give up our individualism. I think these are key points too because you know, ideas have a history and ideas have a place. And I think that in the you know, Western philosophy in particular has made a lot of universalism, it has this aspiration of the universal truth, universal ideas. And it's not very comfortable acknowledging the fact that, in fact, well, maybe time and place are important, right? And so we shouldn't imagine that there's only one right way to think and only one right way to live. Um, that doesn't mean anything goes, by the way, but it means that more than one thing goes. There's an important distinction between those two ideas, right? It's not that everything goes, more than one thing goes. And so when we're looking at different ideas, we're not saying, oh, we should try and become like the Chinese, we should try and become like the Japanese. I think it's, it's useful to think how we are who we are, our culture is what it is because of its history and so forth, and that there's nothing kind of wrong with that, but the ability to kind of like tweak the variables, tone down the things which aren't being helpful to us, turn up the things which could be more helpful to us, and recognising what those things are by looking at other cultures is... I think an extremely hugely uh, valuable resource. I think I'm probably close to my half hour. Um, so let me just conclude. Um, well, I'll give you something to think about in a minute, but to conclude, I just wanted to say, <coughs> overall, I think there are three sort of different ways in which looking at other traditions of thought can be really helpful. One is, relates to this parable you may have heard about the, the, the blind men and the elephants. This is actually originally a Buddhist parable, but it's been become most associated with the Jains. So the idea is the blind men are shown this elephant, and one of them feels the tail and says, oh, this is a soft, furry creature. One of them uh, feels the trunk and says, oh, it's a hard, you know, cold one. one. You don't have to continue the story. As soon as you start to tell the story, you know what the point is, right? It's only by piecing the information together that they get the whole picture. And I think that that's what you see. Different traditions of thought have slightly different angles of looking at different focuses, different ways of looking at things. And actually, by, by looking at several, you com complete a bigger picture of the same one thing. So it's not that they're all in competition with each other. They will give you slightly different angles on the same world, the same individuals, and help us to understand it. Another thing that's important is that Sometimes what you discover when you look through different traditions is that what you thought was there was only one question, there are in fact more than one question. So uh, if, if I just give a simple example about the self, you know, when I did a PhD on personal identity and it was all about what makes the individual person the same individual over time, because that was the main question of what is a self. Whereas of course you look in another tradition and you say an equally important question about what the self is, is what is it which makes the self it is in terms of its social relations and so forth. And the third thing, which I think is perhaps very important, is when it comes to how to live, how we ought to live, I think it's valuable and important to see that there could be more than one answer to that. There could be more than one way of organising a society, and there could be more than one way of living a good life as an individual as well. And again, it's not that any way of life is equally uh, valuable or important. There are ways of living which I think we would rightly want to oppose. We don't want slavery, we don't want inequality and so forth. But there's more than one way and I think that's extremely valuable. So I'll stop talking, but you, you, at this stage in the evening, I understand you're normally meant to have some questions to talk about. What I thought I would pose as little discussion points between you is this. I'm sure there are people with lots of different experience here. A lot of you have very well travelled. If you're not well-travelled physically, I'm sure a lot of you are well-travelled intellectually. So, I don't know, I'd like you to think about, are there any sort of, like, ideas, concepts that you've come across which not, you know, non-Western ways of thinking or non-European ways of thinking, perhaps, which you found particularly interesting and potentially useful that we could learn from, share them and talk about them? And secondly, and this is an and-or option, are there any kind of like, you know, concepts, ideals, values, which you hear 
repeated again and again in the West as though they were obvious, unassailable goods, which actually you think could do with a bit of questioning. I'm sure between those two things, we'll have more than we can possibly talk about after the break and plenty to talk about over more wine, I think. Exactly. Okay, thank you.